Good morning. Good morning. I am so impressed by Dr. Payton and Dr. Sandhill doing that. That was flawless. <laughs> that. Um, I am Dr. Payton. Greg gave me lots of choices of how to spend the half an hour before the presentation. And because I have not gotten up before 9 o'clock uh, <laughs> Central Time since I retired from uh, Southern, I just told him, just, just point me in the right, wherever you want me to go, just po push me a little bit. But now I have awakened and I am excited to be able to um, share a few thoughts with you. Uh, and, and it's really smart, I realize, giving the award before the speech, because you may not want to do it after. <laughs> so let's hope that it's still, uh, they don't take it back. <laughs> So most of you know, let's see, hold on a sec, let me just see how to use this little, uh -oh. well, I didn't want that to be up yet, but we'll just go ahead. Uh, right now, education has a focus on, on rigor, even if you're in counseling, and <clears throat> I'm sure you've heard of that, with uh, some version of uh, the Common Core or whatever uh, new standards people are presenting. But I've been thinking about actually something else, and mainly the power of the country's stories and the personal beliefs that they engender in performance. So I'm gonna start with this set of quotations. Uh, <clears throat> as you're reading, a black after a hard labor through the day will be induced by the slightest amusements to sit up till midnight or later, though knowing he must be out with the first dawn of the morning. They are more ardent after their female, but love seems with them to be more an eager desire than a delicate mixture of treatment and sentiment and sensation. Their griefs are transient, afflictions are less felt and sooner forgotten with them. In general, their existence appears to participate more of sensation than reflection. I advance it therefore that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments of both body and mind. Uh, if you know who said that, and you may have shown up, um, raise your hand for a sec. Okay, that was oh, we're going to get musical accomplishment <laughs> accompaniment when we change the slides. That actually was Thomas Jefferson author of the Declaration of Independence and third president of the U.S. in notes of the state, uh, notes on the state of Virginia. So let's look at another one. Black and other ethnic minority children are uneducable beyond the nearest rudiments of training. No amount of school instruction will ever make them capable citizens. Their dullness seems to be racial. Children of this group should be segregated into special classes and given instruction which is concrete and practical. They cannot master abstractions, but they can be made efficient workers. There is no possibility at present of convincing society that they should not be allowed to reproduce although from a eugenic point of view, they constitute a grave problem because of their prolific breeding. And those in psychology might recognize the name Lewis Terman, who was a Stanford University researcher and professor and former president of the American Psychological Association. 
He said this in 1960, he wrote this in 1916, but his textbooks, the interesting thing about Terman is his textbooks were used for many, many years uh, to train psychologists. And even when his textbooks weren't used, the, the professors who were teaching psychology had been trained by Lewis Terman. And let me go with the, I have lots of them, but um, I'm just going with a few. If you wanted to reduce crime, you could, if that were your sole purpose, you could abort every black baby in this country and your crime rate would go down. Any ideas? If, raise your hand if you know who that said that. Well, that was William Bennett, who was the former U.S. Secretary of Education on his radio show, Morning in America, in 2005. <clears throat> My point here is that these are the stories that we have um, been told in America. And I'm going to ask uh, Reddy if she wouldn't mind to, well, before I go into that, these quotes represent a story and a belief system that's still alive. Most of us have been affected by that belief system because we are members of the country's culture. Whether we consciously believe any of these quotes or not, indeed, uh, re of course, psychologists understand that recent research has indicated that 80 to 90 percent of our daily brain activity is subconscious. Most of what we do is a result of subconscious physiological functioning or subconscious psychological functioning. So even unconsciously, when we look at a low-income African-American child or a school, part of us responds to these negative stereotypes, whether we're engaged in that response or not. <clears throat> Author Beverly Tatum talks about how people become smog breathers. She said, if you live in Los Angeles, you breathe smog. You don't want to breathe smog, you don't plan to breathe smog, you don't go out of your house in the morning and say, today I'm going to breathe me some smog. She just says that if you live in Los Angeles, you breathe smog. She says if you live in America, in the United States of America, we breathe racism. And it doesn't matter what color we are. That's an important part here. We don't try to be, we aren't usually conscious of the racism we breathed. We just go around our regular lives. Uh, and it affects our interactions. Indeed, according to a research report issued by Stanford University's recruitment to expand diversity, diversity and excellence program, the implicit association test, which purportedly tests for subconscious, subconscious racial preferences, found that 75% of whites and Asians demonstrated an implicit bias for whites over blacks. But hold on, black people. Close to 30% of black people also demonstrated an implicit bias for whites over blacks, which goes to show us that the racism fog really affects us all. We're so unconscious of these realities that we seldom see even how even our language is embedded with racist overtones. I'm going to share a tongue-in-cheek essay from Robert Moore on racism in the English language. And we have an expert reader for this one. Some may say blackly, angrily. <coughs> accuse him of trying to blacken the English language, to give it a black eye by writing such black words. They may denigrate him by accusing him of being black-hearted, of having a black outlook on life, of being a black guard, which would certainly be a black mark against him. Some may black brow at him and hope that a black cat crosses in front of him because of this black deed. He may become a black sheep who will be blackballed by being placed on a black list in an attempt to blackmail him to retract his words. But attempts to blackjack him will have a Chinaman's chance of success, 
for he's not for he is not a yellow bellied indian giver of words who will whitewash a black lie he challenges the purity and innocence of the english language he doesn't see things in black and white if there ever was black and white terms for he is a white man if there ever was one however it be a black day when he would not call a spade a spade even though some will suggest a white man calling the english language racist is like the pot calling the kettle black while many may niggardly in their support others will be honest and decent and to them he says that's very white of you so robert moore was writing in a joking way to say that we're just not even aware of how the very language that we speak embed, is embedded with racist terms. Um, and it doesn't have to be, because I've talked to friends from Mali, and I was told that black represents things that are good in that language. The black water is the best water, pure water, the black sun is the um, sun at midday that's the strongest and most and best for plants. Black heart is someone who is doing what they should be doing and is serving things well. So we are constantly bombarded by descriptors that feed racist stereotypes into our already saturated brains. One group of researchers analyzed a database that contains the books, magazines, and articles that the average college-educated American would read over his or her lifetime. They found, according to Dr. David Williams uh, at Harvard, that when the word black appears in American culture, what co-occurs with it are the words poor, violent, religious, lazy, cheerful, and dangerous. When white occurs, the most frequent co-occurring words are wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, and educated. Um, as an example, during uh, Katrina, uh, it's hard to see the young man on the left is black, and the AP article read, a young man walks through chest-deep floodwaters after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on Tuesday and the two individuals on the right are white. It says two res residents raid through, wade through chest deep water after finding bread from a local grocery store in New Orleans, Louisiana. When the racism of this was pointed out to the writer, he was shocked and was hurt. And I believe that he had not, I, I'm sure he had not intended to write something uh, racist, the writer on the right. But it's so embedded, or, or the right on the left, I'm sorry. It's so embedded in our consciousness that that's the first go-to. And that happens um, for educators, for children themselves, for counselors, for all of us. If we're citizens in this country, we have subconsciously embedded these stories. We try to move away from them and our conscious mind argues with that. And, but our first response is frequently that which is uh, subconscious. So my question is, what would our belief systems of this country look like if we were inundated with stories not based on a litany of presumed deficiencies, but on information expressing the true genius of people of color? information not typically brought to light in our country's storybook, cultural storybook. So this is a reference I'm gonna talk about for uh, right now. In 1956, researcher uh, Michelle Jaber, under a research grant from the United Nations Children's Fund, traveled to Africa in order to study the effects of malnutrition on child development. And of course, she was expecting to find child development was lessened as a result, uh, was slowed as a result of malnutrition. She concentrated on Kenya and Uganda, where she made a momentous discovery. 
despite the expectation that malnutrition would cause lower rates of infant development. The developmental rate of Ugandan native infants was so much higher than the established norm that they were able to outperform European children twice or three times their age. She found, in her words, the most precocious and advanced infants ever observed anywhere in the world. The Ugandan infants were months ahead of children of European descent on any intelligence scale used. For example, based on the Giselle tests for early intelligence developed at Yale, Joubert found showed infants between six and seven months a toy, then walked across the room to put the toy into a tall toy box. The African children at six or seven months would leap up and, she says, run across the room, reach into the basket, and retrieve the toy. Besides the extraordinary sensory motor skill of walking and retrieval, the test showed that object permanency had occurred in the child's developing mind, the first great shift of logical processing. Now, these are some very, very old um, pictures, so you won't be able to see them very well, but it just gives you, uh, it may give you a little sense of, of the reality of this. This is a, let's see, what the, yeah, five month old African infant uh, doing a form board, which are like a puzzle, whereas the European norm was 11 months. Uh, here's a child, African infant, seven months old, going to the toy box to retrieve the toy versus 15 months for a European child. Um, African infant, 11 months, climbing steps alone versus 15 months for a European child, for the European norm. One of the things that this means is that for, um, well, I'll, for African American children, this was actually in 1960 in the U.S. African American children. Two U.S. pediatric researchers, Frankenberg and Dodds, uh, crunched. They were crunched a number of of um, numbers, after crunching numbers on thousands of American babies, found the same pattern in African American children. They outperformed children of European descent on every cognitive and motor task available. And even more recently in 2006, Phyllis Ripper Young looked at scores of African American and white infants on the Bailey scale of infant development she found that black infants got higher cognitive skill scores and considerably higher motor skill scores. In other words, she found that if black and white babies were born with the same degree of good health and parental interaction, black babies would surpass whites on all aspects of the Bailey scale. What's interesting about that is that the pediatric development scales were normed on predominantly white children and those scales might actually miss developmental delays of African American children, since many should be expected to perform higher than their white counterparts. So what would it look like if we had that information as a go-to about seeing a classroom of black children? Uh, by the way, the um, Scores tend to start to even out around age four, apparently, and then they start to go in the other direction around age five. And just, there's no ca necessarily causal factor here, but what else happens at around age five? Whoa. Something to think about. Um, this is also evidence of what might look a little different, too many things to play with here, if um, we had some different information.
Okay, this is a comparison of achievement test scores in language in Cuba and other countries in Latin America. This one is Cuba. Um, most all of these other countries have a f lower incidence of children of African descent. Cuba has the highest incidence of children of African descent, and yet their scores on language tests are the highest. And part of that is because the Cuban education system, despite Bernie Sanders getting in trouble saying that, is actually character has been characterized by sustained and high level investments in education and a consistent policy environment and political will in support of education for all. So again, further evidence that there does not have to be and should not be a gap, a, a achievement gap that favors white children. Our, in this country, it is so, and in other uh, countries, it can be so because of the attitudes about black children in large part, attitudes and policies. So I want to talk today about the consequences of the stories we do tell ourselves as Americans about African Americans and other marginalized individuals. I'm going to talk about African Americans, but I think we can fill this in for other marginalized groups as well. <clears throat> I want to pull from the work of, and which I'm sure you all are familiar with, or many of you are, Claude Steele's Whistling Vivaldi, how stereotypes affect us and what we can do. Cultural stories tell us who we are and who others are and how we fit in a given situation in our society. What are some of the stereotypes that are part of the American psyche? So how about other than black people are less intelligent or less than, women are biologically less gifted in math and science than men, uh, white men can't jump, i.e. black people are more naturally talented in athletics. These are some of America's stories. In this book, Whistling Vivaldi, Steele shares a body of research that spectacularly shows just how the cultural stories we all breathe radically affect performance in all manner of settings, but particularly in those that can focus on school achievement. So stereotype threat is what I'm going to talk about, which is the fear of confirming a negative stereotype held about the group with which one identifies. Um, in one of the, when the, uh, a particular re set of research studies that I find most amusing, Jeff Stone, who was a Princeton researcher, gave white and black students from Princeton a golf task. When told nothing, they performed equally. Then half were told that the task was a test of natural athletic ability, and the other half was told nothing. In those who were told that it was a test of natural athletic ability, the white students Signif scored significantly lower on the task. It was just a matter of hitting um, the golf ball into a hole. Af uh, and they scored significantly lower than white, uh, the white students who were told nothing and then the black students. The response in this re is the result of stereotype threat about a cultural story that white people have less athletic ability. So in a different set of white and black students, half was told that the golf task was a test of sports strategic intelligence. And guess what happened then? Just changing the story, the black students now perform significantly worse than the white students. 
because the black students wanted to stereotype that because of the cultural story that black people are less intelligent. And as a result, they averaged four strokes more to get through the task. Now, that is the power of stereotype threat, even in something as simple as a golf task. In another study, two groups of women and men who were high performers in math were given a difficult math test. The first group was told nothing, and women consistently and dramatically underperformed men. Women in the second group were told, you may have heard that women do more poorly on math tests than men, but not on this test. This test has proven itself to equalize test scores for men and women. Lo and behold, the difference in male and female performance disappeared. Uh, in the first instance, a high stereotype threat, the women, uh, females represent the solid line. Uh, when, when you are just given a test, the assumption is it's testing your ability, right? And so the females were under stere high stereotype threat. When they were then told that this is a test that is not, you don't have to worry about essentially score, proving that stereotype about women do, uh, performing less because this test normalizes that and the women scored much higher and actually outperform the males. So how does all this affect African American students? This is where the research has really made a significant point. Study after study conducted by a number of researchers has shown that stereotype, again defined by Steele as the fear of confirming a negative stereotype, uh, stereotype threat, the fear of confirming a negative stereotype held about the group with which one identifies has decreased the performance of African American students significantly in all manner of assessment settings. The classic one was conducted by Claude Steele and Joshua Aronson. Black and white college students matched for ability were given a difficult language test. When black students were told nothing, again, they assumed the test was a measure of intellectual ability, as most tests are, and so were under the, the stereotype threat of the cultural story that black students perform more poorly on intellectual tests. And those black students did perform more poorly. Which is the first set of bars. A high stereotype threat situation. The black students performed uh, essentially one standard deviation lower, which is a typical difference between black and white students. In another group, students were told explicitly that the exercise was not a measure of intellectual ability, but just a laboratory experiment to see how people solved linguistic problems. Thus, the stereotype threat was removed, and they weren't worried about fulfilling a negative stereotype. Sure enough, the black students in this group performed much better, with no statistical difference between the black and white students. So when I was explaining this, to some of my graduate students at uh, Southern University, which is a historically black institution, one of my students said, oh, I, I, I have that, I've had that experience. I scored, I took the praxis test. These were all teachers who were studying to be principals. I took the praxis test three times before I passed it. She said, I didn't pass it until um, I listened to what my grandmother said and put down out my race as white instead of black. So I'm sure her grandmother thought that they were racist scoring the test, which I'm not gonna discount, it, it might have been. But it also, by putting down white, it removed the stereotype threat. She no longer had to fear fulfilling a, a stereotype about black people. Then I found out that many of the black students were doing, did that to become teachers. Now, it helped those individual students, presumably, but I began to think of, okay, so now the state um, records are showing 
that only white people <laughs> pass the test, which then increases stereotype threat in the long run uh, for other students. So an equally interesting question is how does this phenomenon work for those who are under such threat? In a number of innovative experiments, researchers found that African Americans taking a test under stereotype threat had dramatically increased blood pressure readings and pulse rates even when they did not identify feeling anxious or concerned. And that's the subconscious uh, response that our bodies are having to, our, to a belief system that we not, may not even be aware of. Looking at the specifics of what kinds of difficulties the stereotype threat in brain encounters, University of Arizona researchers Tony Schmader and Michael Johns found especially impaired working memory capacity. That is, there is little room to access working memory for anything else when stereotype threat is present. Ann Crendel and colleagues used MRI imaging technology to examine women's brains during stereotype threatening mathematics testing situations compared to non-stereotype threatening situations. They found that the brains of those not under stereotype threat fired in areas associated with mathematical learning. Those under threat, however, showed heightened brain activism in a neural region back here associated with social and emotional processing. In other words, they were expending a lot of brain energy on dealing with the emotions of stereotype threat in that setting. The authors say stereotype threat may direct women's attention toward the negative social and emotional consequences of confirming negative stereotypes about their group, thereby increasing performance anxiety. Similar studies by social, French social scientist Jean-Claude Crozet had the same, had led him to conclude a mind trying to defeat stereotype threat leaves little mental capacity free for anything else we're doing. Ironically, the more pressure we put on students susceptible to stereotype threat to do well on a test, the more we may be reducing their performance. Those who are most successful uh, at test taking in those schools that are most successful at having students, uh, particularly marginalized students, do well on tests, do not put focus on the test. They put focus on excellent teaching and they tell the children, hey, you got this. They change the story. By the way, there's also a body of research by Dr. Maya McNeely from Duke University, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Brondolo of St. John University, Dr. Na Oyokwate from Rutgers, and Dr. David Williams from Harvard and increasing numbers of others that strongly suggest that the increased levels of heart disease and hypertension among African Americans is a direct result of the racially based negative encounters, many not on direct intentional racism, but on the subconscious cultural stories ever present in American society, the microaggressions. Interestingly, these particular health issues are not found in Africans living in Africa. In addition, according to Dr. Kwate, a 2010 study identified symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder in students who not only experienced but merely witnessed racist incidents. The more vicarious incidents they experienced, the more signs of trauma even if the racist incident did not happen to an individual, but he or she is aware of it, they are at risk for PTSD and all that implies in classrooms and communities. I'm, I work with some teachers and principals in Baltimore, and all of the principals said after the Freddie Gray murder, then the children and the communities were all not only on edge, but were exhibiting uh, symptoms of trauma, of the fight or flight, the um, needing to, or, or the children quickly escalating to um, a physical violence, 
But all of this, and again, it's important to understand that it, it doesn't have to happen to the individual when we think about trauma. Living in this society creates trauma for those children who look like people who have been uh, physically or otherwise traumatized. But let's return to the education of students who have traditionally uh, fared poorly in our schools. Stereotyping affects our educators as much as it affects our children. As a matter of fact, the stereotypes held by our teachers and educators as citizens of this country directly affects the stereotype threats that our students face. Educator bias begins with the youngest of our children. Uh, many of you are probably aware of a recent Yale study that shows that racial bias, especially against black boys, leads to preschool teachers expecting black boys to misbehave, resulting in a 300% greater likelihood that they will be suspended from preschool than their white preschool classmates who exhibit the same behavior. And the study had teachers, black and white, look at videos of uh, black and white children in a preschool classroom, although the children were actors, and they were told to uh, figure out which children were likely to be problematic uh, behaviorally. And they then, the test was not what they came up with, but they tracked their eyes. And they all looked at the black boys. So if you're looking because you're expecting to see certain behavior, what happens? You see certain behavior. If we understand the dire consequences of our country's cultural stories on marginalized communities and students, what can we do about it? How can we seek equitable outcomes for all students? Since, uh, as I mentioned, most of the beliefs attached to the stereotypic stories we've breathed in all of our lives operate at a level below consciousness. Is there any hope that we might get rid of the subconscious belief driving negative story stereotypes, lowered expectations, and lowered performance? How do you get rid of something that you're not aware of? I believe there is. There is some neuroscience research that suggests that we don't have to get rid of the old stories. We just need to create new ones. Belief in the new stories if we're inundated with them, replaces the old ones. We have to, the, our conscious mind has to be inundated with different visions, ideas to reprogram the subconscious mind. We have to give ourselves and our students new stories that uncover the brilliance they exhibited as babies. We have to give students the psychological space to allow them to utilize their full brain power to engage with academic content. That is, we have to replace factors that may cause brains to either shut down or become so concerned with the emotional trauma of stereotype threat that they have nothing left for academics. For us and for the researchers cited by Steele, it's not sufficient to say that stereotype threat exists. We have to figure out what to do. The question some of the researchers asked is, is there any way to perform, improve performance by reducing stereotype threat? Research shows a few ways to reduce such threat, mostly by, again, changing the stories that the test takers are exposed to, as I talked about earlier. When the story makes the test taker believe that he or she belongs or is in the group that is expected to do well, then that is what happens. A sense of belongingness is what Steele identified uh, made, all, made all the difference for black students on elite campuses where they are most likely to feel as outsiders. Belongingness is a major element of dropping out as well. Nilda Flores Gonzalez uh, found that the difference in her study, the difference between those who dropped out and those who stayed in school was a sense of belonging that started in elementary school. 
when kids believed that they, uh, when teachers made children in elementary school believe that they were part of the school community, they were important for uh, what was happening in the classroom, that their communities were important, that they, everything about them contributed to the school. Then in high school, those kids did not drop out. They became what uh, Professor Gonzalez says, they became school kids. The children who did not get that in elementary school became what she calls street kids because they got those same emotional bonding senses, a uh, sense of belongingness from people on the street or peers on the street rather than from school. So dropouts actually start in kindergarten. In order to see how changing the story and creating a sense of belongingness are actualized, researchers conducted a deceptively simple study in public middle schools to attempt to reduce the negative consequences of the stereotypes students are dealing with or their sense of identity threat. Uh, because African American and other marginalized students may face threats to their identity as scholars in classrooms, um, they had to figure out how to change that identity threat. In my work, I see this phenomenon on a regular basis. Indeed, that's where the title of the last book came from, um, Multiplication is for White People, from a child saying to her tutor, uh, why are you trying to teach me this, Miss L, multiplication? Black people don't multiply. Black people just add and subtract. White people multiply. Now clearly nobody ever said this to this child, but by living in this society, that's something that she had internalized to the point where it was definitely affecting her performance. A black eighth grader said uh, when I spoke at a school a number of years ago, a young teacher told me that this eighth grade boy said to her, so Miss Summers, they made us the slaves because we're dumb, right? And other students in a school that was rated triple F by the state of Florida said to me when I talked to them, they put us in F schools because they think we're F people, right? So researchers Jeff Cohen and Julio Garcia wondered if simply giving ability stereotype public school students a chance to develop a self-affirming narrative, a positive story in the school setting could reduce the threat they feel in the classroom and increase a sense of belonging. And if it did, would that improve their academic performance? Close to the beginning of the school year, the researchers went to several racially integrated seventh grade uh, classrooms near Hartford, Connecticut, and asked teachers to give each student in their classroom an envelope with his or her name on it. Instructions in the envelope asked half of the students randomly selected to write down their two or three most important values. For example, family relationships, friendships, being good at music, their religion, etc. And then write a brief paragraph about why these values were important to them. That is, to put these value statements in the form of a personal narrative a story about themselves. This took only 15 minutes, and then they put what they had written back into the envelope and handed it to the teacher. I don't know, I don't even think the teacher necessarily read it. Um, later in the school year, they did a, a similar, a couple of follow-up writing exercises. That was it. A control group was asked to write about values they did not find important, but others might. Thus, all students wrote about values, but only some wrote a personally self-affirming narrative. The results were dramatic. The experimental group, those who wrote stories affirming their personal and community values, showed increased performance <coughs> as compared to their performance in the first three weeks of school. Those with the lowest early performance increased the most. By contrast, the grades of the black students in the no affirmation control group kept going down, making the racial achievement gap in these classrooms even wider over the course of the school term. 
Follow-up research showed their higher achievement and thus smaller gap with white students lasted amazingly for at least two years. Now this just happened maybe two or three times uh, during an entire school year for one year. And it existed in all classes, not just the subject area where the written affirmations took place. White students showed no difference in performance no matter what great, uh, group they were in because their intellectual identities were not under question in the classroom setting. There was no negative cultural story about their intellectual prowess. This research was replicated with the same results with Latinx students in Boulder, Colorado. Positive self-affirmations about one's identity leads to higher school performance. I'm gonna read that again. Positive self-affirmations about one's identity leads to higher school performance. Amazing. What could happen if we designed instruction to regularly express and build upon the students' strengths, uh, the strengths of students' communities and their families? What if the literature they read, the science they explored, the mathematics they studied, the social science studies they researched was approached in a way to connect to their lived experiences, the issues facing their communities, the, social, the history of people who look like them, and their cultural and intellectual legacies. But of course, we can only make such instructional connections if we work to learn about who they are, the strengths of their communities, and the history of their cultures. I won't go into it in detail, but this is uh, a rubric that I've been using with teachers to say how can you connect that whenever you have curricular content, we need to think about how we can connect it to students' cultural and intellectual legacies, to students' lived experiences, so that it is of value outside the classroom and it's connected to the students' communities. I'm not saying that excellent instruction and rigorous content are not important, they most definitely are and low-income, underperforming students will not succeed without them. Unfortunately, they frequently don't receive them as stories of black inferiority subconsciously manifest themselves within the belief systems of both educators and students and result in teachers expecting less of African-American students and consequently teaching less and in African-American students and other marginalized students expecting to fail so giving up before they even try. And that becomes a perfect catch-22. So the lower the uh, complexity of the content, students perceive that. And they believe then that you are teaching down to them and so they begin to believe that they can't perform any higher, so they uh, fail even in that um, watered down instruction. So interestingly, Steele and other researchers tell us that putting students in remedial programs can make the problem worse. Again, because it reinforces the belief that they are less competent. There are other ways to create community-centered, culturally connected instruction that also develops the skills that remedial programs uh, frequently fail to provide. Petra Hendry, a professor at LSU, managed to treat marginalized African-American students as scholars at the same time she and their teachers connected them to their history and communities. Uh, this is McKinley High School in Baton Rouge. It was the first public school for black students in the region starting in the early 1900s. So the students did, with their teachers and university professors, an oral history of the school. Any remediation that was done for this group of students was done in the context of the bigger picture. They were doing university research and 
they were reading archival, they read archival data, they interviewed people, teachers and former students. Uh, my mother was one of the people they interviewed. That's not my mother, but <laughs> <laughs> she was one of the people they interviewed. Uh, and they transcribed the interviews. And if any of you know, have, it, have any of you ever tried to transcribe? Yes. It was easy, huh? <laughs> It is very difficult, but not only is it difficult, you have to learn spelling, punctuation, uh, capitalization, uh, paragraphing, making decisions about paragraphing and glossing. So all of that, ha they had to do all of that in creating the transcriptions. They were also brought to, uh, the, the students presented to their community their work, I've just recently uh, gathered some of their, or found some of their work, well gathered, uh, for a young, a young professor at Harvard who's doing a study on uh, black education, black teachers. Um, and it's in the oral history library at LSU and also at the public libraries. So their work continues to be um, used. Yeah, they presented, I don't know if I mentioned that, AERA. Uh, so they, their whole, I, the story changed. Even though they were remedial students, they were no longer remedial students. They were scholars, they were researchers. The story was that we can do the work that university students do. So we must create in the classroom a sense of belonging, as this project did, uh, a sense of the students being able to become the vision that we might hold for them rather than the vision that the society might hold for them. And we can overcome the identity threat if we do this that I believe causes so many students to give up on schooling before they have the opportunity to really try. So I'm gonna end with a story. <clears throat> Speaking of stories. Um, so the little boy goes to, I just saw one the other day go, um, when I was walking um, my dog, goes to the, to the basketball court and he keeps uh, shooting baskets. At first he gets none. He comes back the next day and he gets one or two. He comes back the next day, next week, and maybe he gets three or four. So he keeps getting better and better. Why is that? Why? Huh? Why does he keep getting better? <laughs> yeah, well, he keeps doing it, he keeps practicing. But the bigger question to me is, why in the face of apparent failure does he keep coming back? What causes his persistence? When at school, the first sign of failure causes withdrawal, disidentification with school, what story is he telling himself in basketball? that makes him keep trying. Perhaps the story goes like this. I know I can get better if I keep trying. I know I can because I see so many people who look like me who are successful at this. If I become good, I know I will get accolades from my peers and community. I will fit in. Getting better will help me become a more valued member of a group. The better I become, the more I can contribute to the team. And contrast that to his school story. The world says I'm dumb, so there's no use trying. I don't know people who I look like and relate to who are good at this. If I become good, my peers may reject me. I'm in this alone. No one will benefit if I get better at school stuff. I'm suggesting that we have the capacity to change the story by, like Steele suggests, adjusting the environment. The new story goes, 
I'm smart and I know people who look like me are smart because my school regularly introduces me to the brilliance of those individuals from the past and the present. I work collaboratively to achieve a clear goal. My individual improvement brings success to my group. And we can design instruction so that it's not just for the individual success, but for the group success. I know my peers and community will praise me for my improvements because the school organizes regular academic expos, not just sports events, in which I display what I've accomplished to my community. And those are not just for those kids who are at the top. Those expos are like those kids from McKinley, where every child is a part of the the story of the presentation. If I am not immediately successful, my teachers in school let me know that it's only because I need more practice, not because I can't do it. I know I'm smart because everybody and everything at my school is organized to tell me so. Perhaps if we can help schools learn more from basketball, then we might come to craft stories that create for teachers, students, and the society at large the expectation that black and brown children should not only expel at, excel at sports, but that they are also designed to excel at all things academic. To create for our students, as I have come to call it, culturally affirming identities of excellence. Thank you very much. So I think we have, yeah. I think we have time for a few questions, one or two. Um, so if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question about the Or a comment. Don't make me have to come and make you change your story. <laughs> I mean, I can ask one. Um, as someone who teaches at the graduate level, um, and oftentimes is working with students who've had a long history of being socialized into not believing that they can or they're worthy, I was wondering if you could sort of offer some insights or tips on how to sort of work with outside the school setting. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of the same. One of the things that, that actually Steele talks about is what makes students believe the feedback or, or take into account the feedback that professors give them. Um, one of the things that folks, they try different methods. Uh, they tried giving, saying something positive first and then something, and then talking about what to change. Uh, but what, what seemed to work was telling the students, I have very high standards, and I believe from what, you, what I see of you that you can meet those standards. Uh, and if you would like, and what I think you can do to meet those standards, to change uh, this paper to fully meet those standards is X, Y, and Z. So under those circumstances, uh, college students had a better, if you start out with, I have high standards and that I believe you can, then college students have a much greater um, chance of following your feedback rather than assuming that you are uh, criticizing them because they're black or they're brown. Uh, they begin to change the their own stories about what they can do. So that seems to be one of the things that, that works really well. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for speaking today. Um, I'm working currently as, I'm, I'm a community social worker. I'm working with the documentary film space. Um, so I'm blending in my organizing background into this very crazy fast paced world that is storytelling and documentary art. Right? Cool. But, you know, being a practitioner in the field and having learned this education and understanding, um, we 
often kind of are conflicted in how we're integrating DEI um, with you know just various understandings and, and uh, ways in which people enter the space. Um, so I'm curious, just as nonprofits or any kind of you know work being done in the field on the ground um, within community organizations, what have you. Um, any suggestions for how we can pull in this incredible research into real practice, given various understandings? Does that make any sense? Um. Well, it would, except I'm from Louisiana, and New York's uh, <laughs> accents are a little. So you did what now? You, you were in what kind of setting? Uh, I, more in community social work and the engagement work. So I, I just, okay. you know. And what is the situation that you would find problematic? Just, just interested in how organizations are viewing diversity, inclusion, and equity work. It's um, too broad. I need I need something more specific. And uh, how they are. What problem staff, are you facing? How they're treating staff. How they're supervising and elevating the work of Black and Brown people in their organizations. Um, well, they aren't often, <laughs> and that's what you were really asking. Yes. <laughs> um, so how many black and brown people would you say work in that setting? Um, there are a lot. There are a lot, I would say. And how many black and brown people are in leadership? Two. Right. Three. Okay. So clearly, the people in leadership are not aware of, uh, well, they are dealing with individuals' responses to what they do. And it probably needs to be a group response uh, to allow people to understand that there is more than what they are um, seeing, but everybody in similar circumstances has the same problem, and the same problem exists because of what you know we've just talked about, that people are not able to see the value, the intellectual value of the black and brown people who do the work that, who are on the ground, so to speak. And so that has to, I think, has to just, it, it, that is part, that's the battle. I mean, that's the fight. You have to collectively work to present that information to those uh, people in leadership to say, you know, I've, I've been reading and heard about some interesting things. Can we take a look at this? And what can we do to um, make sure that this happens? But just know that the battle that you're in is the battle that black and brown people face in this country. And as someone told, a wise person told me when I was much younger, don't leave one job in America because, because of racism. Because every job in America is going to deal with racism. And that's the battle that we all have to, to work on. Thank you. We do one more question. Somebody, right here. Right, right, right. Over here, ready. Put, put your hand up. <laughs> no, don't just email, you're here. Thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering. Is that on? Yeah. OK, Thank pretty you for close. Presentation. I'm wondering, as a student, and I think many people in this room are also students, um, if you've come across anything in your research about interventions we can do student to student to help support each other um, in creating better stories. Mm. I think my answer, I don't know research. Did you hear the question back there? Yeah. The answer that I would proffer is to listen. And to ask questions, are, are you running into, I've heard about the, uh, you know, about um, things that are going on. Is that something that is happening here? Can you describe it 
to me what ask and ask those students what what would be what do you think would be helpful um, for me to do as as an ally in this situation so a lot of times nobody listens to that's why I called one of the articles a silenced dialogue because the people of color will just shut down because they feel like nobody's listening and so to the extent that we can give each other a voice and hear, I think that makes, that will make a lot of difference. Thank you for asking that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Duncan. Uh, Dr. Duncan will be doing a book signing with her books for sale uh, during the lunch hour. I'm looking at Greg. Uh, so if you would like to continue conversation after your question, uh, please stop by. We'll be right outside, Howen. Uh, thank you again, um, and we'll see you all over the course of two days. Thank you, Dr. Delpin. Are you going to take the award back?